Hey everybody, welcome to the Real Late Show with Chris and Craig, and we got the whole group here tonight. Yeah. Um, Craig, Robert, and obviously me. So uh, how, how are you guys all doing today? Doing good. How are you guys? Good to see you guys. Life is getting in the way, so we had a late start, so got a bunch of stuff. So let's get rolling on some of those things. Um, I have not thought or done anything with Mel Gibson in a long time. And I look at Deadline, which I like to look at for our stories. And Mel Gibson, he's a busy man. He says he's going to direct Lethal Weapon 5. I didn't think we are going to have a Lethal Weapon 5. And he's going to do the sequel to Passion of the Christ. Uh, this is how long Passion of the Christ came out. I think I was writing and Robert was the editor. And maybe before you were the editor. Maybe you went to Yeah, editor. yeah. It's been a while. Um, yeah, it's been a while. But it's, but um, yeah, so he's directing both. We need to talk about what he's. It's an old story, Chris. It's an old story, you know. It's one of the original stories out there. Oh, so. the Passion of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll say it's <laughs> it may happen. Um. Well, and then okay, so we're and again, this is news to me. I heard rumors about Passion of the Christ. And I heard rumors about Lethal Weapon. Didn't realize that these are both on the table. So he has an interview. Um, I, I would think he's pretty easy interview right now. We probably could have gotten it. You know what I mean? You never know. Uh, well, <laughs> he has a new, Yeah, he was interviewed by Comic Book. I, I didn't hear of. I, I haven't heard of Comic Book as a publication, so his standards are going a little bit lower now. Uh, but you know, they were like, "Hey, what are you directing first? And he's like, "I don't know. It's the funny thing. There's various obstacles. It's not just budgetary. There's like a bunch of reasons why something goes and why it doesn't." It's really a crapshoot at this point. You know what goes first and which came first, whether it's the chicken or the egg. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> you never heard the story of the Bible being described as a crapshoot. You know, it's like a crapshoot. If the Bible happens or not. Um, I'm, so I, I think the passion of the Christ would be the resurrection. Mm -hmm. yeah. It sounds like that's what the story is okay. going to be. Right. And <laughs> Yeah, it's not like, you know, it's not like Titanic too, right? I mean, oh, yeah. there, yeah. are, there are Bible stories to tell after, you know, the crucifixion and everything. So obviously there's stories that can be told there. And so it's not quite like saying, oh, you know, Jack comes back in Titanic 2 or something like that. It's not the same right. kind of deal. Yeah. Still, you know, uh, I, 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 would, I imagine there's an audience for that movie, I, for sure. Oh, I yeah. think that yeah. it probably would do pretty well. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Mel Gibbs is the right person to be doing it i mean um you know if you ask me like i you know i've i've said before i'm i'm not a big cancel culture guy i don't really believe in it i don't really believe it happens a lot i think people uh people like you know um exaggerate it quite a bit but if there's anybody that maybe deserves to be a little bit canceled maybe it's Mel gibson yeah <laughs> yeah i i don't know i mean as a faith guy i don't I hate saying this because a lot of my faith friends were really into the passion of the Christ. So I feel like if I criticize it, like I'm, I lost my faith card or whatever, but it, you know, I went to cover the passion of the Christ the night it came out. I got to tell you, it's a somber movie. I did not enjoy it. And I guess the movie is supposed to show you what Jesus went through and everything, but it was not an enjoyable movie. I mean, no. I, I had no desire ever to see it again. I know some people probably have seen it like a hundred times by now, but I'm like, oh, I'm done. You know, it's and I, yeah. I mean, I guess the resurrection won't be as gory. I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, it's not necessarily a movie you expect to have fun at. Um, you wouldn't want to go. Right. It's not. A, I mean, it's not by any stretch. You know, there's not going to be a lot of levity in it or anything like that. I mean, it's a pretty grim tale um but it's it, it is very graphic the movie's very graphic it's it is very difficult to watch even for someone of faith um it's very difficult to watch uh and um you know it's not quite like going to church every easter and seeing it like put on in front of you know you know at, 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 like in, you know in front of the pulpit it's not quite like that i mean it's it may be something that christians feel like they need to watch at some point um, you know, it's like, a, you know, you feel like a, like a kind of a, uh, an obligation to watch it. Um, 
you know, but it does, I wouldn't imagine there's a lot of, I, I can't imagine there's a lot of people that like to watch it a lot. It's, it's, it's it yeah. even, I mean, why would you want to see, um, you know, basically you know, like torture on, on screen of like, you know, of, of Christ. I mean, it is, it's torturous. It really is. Well, and I never became that movie that, you know, some of these movies were like, Hey, every time it's on cable, I just have to check it out. You know, I, I, I only know. know it's on cable. I don't care. I don't know. Well, like I said, I saw I mean, one I'm like enough. I mean, I'm done it's one it. of those movies that's kind of like, you know, like, you know, like you, you should watch it at some point. Um, like Schindler's, like maybe a Schindler's List, oh, kind yeah. of thing, you know, but it's not something, you know, that you're going to have a good time watching. Schindler's List was probably the most jarring movie I ever saw. I mean, Passion of the Christ did it for me. And like I said, I might, you know, rating one group or the other or whatever. But no, Schindler's List, my mouth was like open. I actually saw it. I never saw it in the theater. It was probably a year or two after it came out, like on TV. I think it was NBC one night. They're like, all right, we're going to show the uncut Schindler's List and there'll be no commercials. And I watched that. My mouth was like, you know, I mean, it was just, yeah, it was stunning. But I did yeah. see it in theaters. I was in high school and I, uh, you know, we, uh, I had a class field trip to watch it. And I, I like, I, yeah, it was, um, stunning. Yeah, it was and, um, I can't, I, I like, I would find it hard to believe that, like, uh, like classes would do that today, would go to see a movie like Schindler's List on a school, on a school sanctioned trip, you know, like during the school day kind of thing. But, um, well, it showed how awful and evil anti Semitism is. And, and not that I was questioning if it's okay or not to be anti Semitic, but once you saw that, it really just brought to life how, yeah. Horrible people were treated back then. So, well, let's talk about the other thing on a brighter note because I'm depressing myself of how. That's the thing about Gibson, though, right? Is that like his his sort of anti-Semitic rants is why I got him canceled in the first place. That he's also like been kind of a, uh, a you know a mean dad, I guess. Like, but he, like he's yeah. like just been recorded, just sort of being kind of a jerk. But yeah. I think the real big thing was like. And that's what it comes back to me. Like, you know, he's 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 expressed a lot of really sort of like vile anti-Semitic sort of feelings and thoughts about things. And for him to do a, uh, you know, to continue to do movies about, you know, Jesus Christ and, um, you know, it doesn't it, seem, it's strange. Yeah. It doesn't seem it is, it is. But at the, at the same time, it it's the the old. Can you separate the art from the artist? You know, like yeah, yeah. we talk, you know, you talk a lot of, uh, in the movie industry. Roman Polanski is a fine filmmaker who has been convicted of sexual crimes in America and will no longer ever come to America because of that. And he still makes movies. He still has a lot of actors that jump at the opportunity to work with him. Um, Woody Allen you know, even more in the mainstream in, in, in recent years, you know, there's been a lot of actors and actresses that have come to his defense despite claims against him. So it, it's really, that's part of it with Mel Gibson. And, you know, he took a, a, you know, whether it was because of the cancel culture or, or just because he couldn't get projects, you know, he was off for what, 10 years from Apocalypto to then making Hacksaw Ridge, which, you know, the thing about Mel Gibson is, is he's a talented artist. You know, he makes fine films. He's, you know, Braveheart's a great film. I'm a big fan of The Passion Absolutely. of the Christ. Um, yeah. I love The Passion of the Christ. It's probably one of those, like, one-watch kind of movies, which there are very few of them. But it is, like you said, you guys both, I both agree that it's 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 a hard watch, even though it, it's a, a worthwhile watch. And Hacksaw Ridge was another, you know, movie that, you know, Andrew Garfield was terrific in that movie, and it was a really sort of unique World War II story that maybe hadn't been told yet. So it's it's almost like you've got to find a way to can you separate an artist from the art and, and appreciate the art that's created versus understanding that there are issues with that artist that maybe they or you can never overcome based on some of the claims or some of the factual evidence out there. And, and I think that that goes for a lot of people, not just Mel Gibson, but, you know, certainly, um, you know, he's had 
quite a bit of time off in Hollywood and a lot of it's his own doing and most of it, probably all of it's his own doing. But, you know, again, there's always second, third, fourth chances. It seems like for a lot of these people in Hollywood that, you know, maybe do something that people don't appreciate or are just absolutely hateful or, you know, something that you would condemn to the, to the highest mountaintops, but yeah. they still come back and get the funding or they still are, you know, considered those, talented artists that you want to work with or that people want to fund projects with. And, you know, Mel Gibson's kind of had that resurrection a little bit, if you will, no pun intended with his upcoming movies possibly, but you know, he's worked a lot more lately and he's now starting to get back into more, you know, obviously Hacksaw Ridge was studio filmmaking, but he's obviously got the backing of studios moving forward with like a passion of the Christ sequel and a lethal weapon sequel too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I I will probably if he makes a Lethal Weapon five, I'll probably check it out out of pure curiosity. Yeah, yeah. And I won't stop watching Mel Gibson stuff because I do. I mean, he's made some some good stuff in the past. And if it, I'm flipping through channels, or whatever, and I see something like uh, like Braveheart or something like that, I might I might stop and watch it. An old Lethal Weapon or something like that for sure. But I think I draw the line at. Um, someone who's expressed anti-Semitic views doing a movie about, sure. you know, the King of the Jews, you know, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. I think that's where I draw the line, and it's like because it'd be like it'd be like a, a Holocaust denier doing a story film making a movie about World War II, you know, or it'd be like right, uh, right. you know a um, you know a, a 9/11 truth or doing a doing a movie about 9/11 or something, you know, it's that kind of thing. That contradiction, I think, is where I draw the line. Yeah, and, and I get weary sometimes because in religion and politics, there's movies that if you're a certain way, they kind of try to make you see. You know what I mean? Like being a pastor's kid, there was a bunch of Christian movies over a while. I was like, oh, you should go see it. Bring your youth group or whatever. Uh, politics, it's the craziness that we have in politics. Like I get all these like right wing friends like, oh, you gotta go see Reagan if you're a right winger. I'm like. Crap. I mean, Damn. if if I go to see a movie, yeah, I like historical movies, not because I'm a certain way either way. I like art because I like art. Don't throw art in my face if you say, hey, you're a Christian, so go see his, you know, Passion of the Christ or whatever, or hey, you're Democrats, so go see this. I want to see art because I like art. And if it's something I'm interested in, great. But if it's not, fine. I mean, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like some of this crap gets shoved down our throats. And that's, yeah. the, I, that's I, the worst part of it, um, too, because, like, you want movies to, I, I don't want to say, like, rudimentarily take a side, but you want movies, you want a director to have an idea and a vision and a voice for why they're making the certain movie. But you also want it to be fair in a, in a sense that, if you're telling a story like a, a prime example, I think is Oliver Stone's W the biopic of George W. Bush. I think a lot of people went in expecting that movie to just be an absolute hit piece on George W. Bush. And it really wasn't, especially for an Oliver Stone kind of movie where you expected a, a guy like him to really take a hard stance on someone that maybe he didn't agree with their politics. But I think the best, the best movie making and the best art, comes out of being able to tell your story and the story that you want to tell, but doing it in, you know, making three dimensional characters and making people relatable. Even if you don't like that character that's on screen that you can maybe relate to them in some way, shape or form and, and finding a reason for why they do their things, what's their motivation. And I think that's the, when you're talking about movies, especially you want, you want movies to to be deeper than just the surface level. And I think that's maybe what we were talking about with Reagan over the last several weeks, where it seemed like it was a, you know, made for TV movie type production, not necessarily like a, you know, a three dimensional look at Reagan as a, as a president or whatever, you know, however they decided to delve into that story. And I think that's, that's where you kind of see some of those political movies or movies that might have, you know, politics at the center of it maybe fail because they're not you can you can be as left or right wing as you want in a movie but we need to have a little bit of both sides we need to have depth of character study 
in motivation and why people are doing what they're doing on screen. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Hey, let's talk. I mean, we can't not talk about Lethal Weapon. I mean, come on. Um, I am looking forward to Lethal Weapon. I'm like Robert. I mean, I've enjoyed Lethal Weapon in the past. I can't imagine not wanting to see it sometime. You know, when I say sometime, probably not the first weekend in the theater. Maybe when it hits the Netflix or Paramount, wherever it's going to hit. You know, I'm, I'm in. I, I, I'm good. I will say I am distracted, though. I did enjoy the Lethal Weapon movies. They were good. But I also enjoy It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I love the, um, what do you call it, the spoofs they've done of Lethal Weapon. And I'm confused because they've done Lethal Weapon, what, five, six, and seven. And we see here that Mel Gibson is directing Lethal Weapon five. And I got to admit, when I saw that story this afternoon, I'm like, wait a minute, didn't I already saw that? I forgot. Was there already <laughs> one? Yeah, it's, it's Always it's Sunny spoof. So it'll be good. Yeah. And, and maybe for as good as it might be, is it going to pale in difference to It's Always Sunny? Again, obviously, It's Always Sunny was a spoof, but those really made me laugh. Those really off-the-wall crazy ones. I don't yeah. know. Maybe they can't top it. So I, I guess that's my only concern. I don't to know. I had, to look, I had to look just now to make sure Danny Glover's still alive, and he is. So Oh, he is? Okay. <laughs> that's good. I mean, um, I'm assuming Danny Glover's coming back. You have to have Danny Glover in it, right? I mean, he I like he has to show up at some point. I don't know. Well, they did do it. You got can't do you can't have Riggs without Murtaugh. I mean, that's yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's just iconic. It's just yeah, yeah. And don't don't do it like in the Edge Runs Four where you're trying to shove a guy in there. Shove, you know? Like yeah, like have like yeah. have a some like the kids of like Riggs and Mur right. Murtaugh now are the new cops or something like, yeah, don't do something stupid like that either. Yeah. Bring Glover back. I don't care how old he is or if he's infirmed. I mean, he's got to come back in some way. We need the old guy. Uh, yeah. And I think it's always saying did the Top Gun, but I think that was shoved into a lethal weapon for some reason. Wasn't that? Or, or, or am I getting confused myself? There was always it's always sunny where they're kind of making fun of the classic volleyball scene from Top Gun. Mm, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm throwing it's always sunny in there, but I, I like the show, so I have to kind of fire it in there. So that'll be good. Uh, sorry, are you watching the Lethal Weapon? Craig, you seem like the Lethal Weapon guy. Or I mean, you, you know, I, I I think what I watch, I'm not going to like seek this out necessarily because I'm not. I'm kind of like beaten over the head with sequels at this point, you know, and I'd rather see something that I've never seen before, but that doesn't mean that a sequel can't be fun or can't be, you know, inventive. I'm, you know, there's some interest in this. I mean, obviously Gibson directing, but I did see that. And, and obviously things can change because it's still in the development stage, but uh, Shane Black is uh, going to write be a, is a co-writer on the screenplay. And uh, he's done some interesting things. Iron Man three kiss, kiss, bang, bang, um, the nice guys. So, you know, I mean, tonally it could be some, it could have some intrigue with Shane Black coming into the, to the fold writing this screenplay. So, you know, I'll hold out hope. Okay. You could argue, you could argue that some of those movies are basically lethal weapon five. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the nice guys, like, you know, or like, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's in that, it's in that, um, yeah, and that that's why it matters, I think, so much. Now, it's not to say that because X, Y, and Z are involved in a project that it's automatically going to be successful, but you know that's why it does kind of matter sometimes who you have working behind the camera, whether it's the director, whether it's the writing team. You know, sometimes it really matters because it starts at that ground level with a screenplay, and you know. You'd, you'd rather see someone like Shane Black maybe there than a newcomer that maybe grew up on the Lethal Weapons movies and, and maybe has an idea for a movie instead. So, And I know Black also wrote or maybe was a showrunner for the Lethal Weapon TV series that had a short run, but uh, we'll see. Sounds good. Hey, um, we're up against this. Let me skip the next thing I was going to talk about. Um, Saturday Night Live is coming back this weekend. Um, you know, not always excited about Saturday Night Live lately, but I feel it's like my duty to watch it. It's weird. Now, now sometimes I don't watch the whole show. I take advantage of it being on the clips on YouTube or Peacock or whatever. I'm looking forward to it. Um, the story I shared with you guys, 
there's a teaser where they're kind of going back to the history, which is good. And they're saying, hey, maybe more nostalgia will be this year. This is the 50th anniversary, big year for it. But then look at the first couple of hosts. I know you have to have current people, obviously. But you've got like Nate Bergazzi, who's okay, he's funny, but Ariad Grande, John Mulaney. I mean, I know they've all had some history, but other than Michael Keaton, can't we bring back more older people? I know you can't do that every week. I don't know. For it being the 50th anniversary, like I like Mulaney and everything. I, I don't know. Maybe some of the guys that we all know and love, like Norm is dead and a couple other people are that you know, aren't around as much, but I don't know. I, I, I guess the first couple hosts just didn't blow me away. I mean, I like Jane Smart. Looks like she's doing the premiere. Damn, and she's, okay. uh, she's, she's, she's in a, she's, I mean, she's doing really well now with her HBO series hacks. It's very funny. Very good show. Great show. Um, so she's, I think, I think that, yeah, she's super, she's super funny. I think she'll do a great job as host. So. Um, but, I, but, I'm glad to see that. I'll see the premiere for sure. I think she'll okay. do great. I think a lot um, of it's it's always going to be about the writing because this is a right. show. This is a show based on writing. Now, thankfully for them, they're going to be butted up right up against a huge election. So yeah. I'm sure that they're going to have material for the first, oh, yeah. really, really for the whole season. They're going to have material up through their, you know, whatever, you know, in May when they're done. But um, I, you know, I mean, John Mulaney is always kind of a reliable host, though. And he's always pretty funny. He's very sharp and witty. Um, you know, Michael Keaton's kind of a wild card. I don't know that Michael Keaton's ever hosted. If I'm not, I don't think he has. Um, but Michael Keaton's a very talented guy, and I, I, I'm interested to see what they do with him. You know, Ariana Grande is another one of those like kind of like recent year favorites where she's been on SNL yeah. every year the last several years, and she seems pretty reliable too. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Gene Smart is is wildly talented, and whether it's Hacks or you know Mayor of East Town or Watchmen, she has just been on a roll as an actress, and I think she, as long as she gets the 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 backing of the writing team at SNL, I, I think she's going to hit a home run, and I, I think most of them will. It's it really is just going to come down to the writing team, and I also think the second biggest important thing is the cast the cast around them are they able to develop a cast that can you name more than anybody anybody other than keenan thompson or you know right. somebody like that so i think the biggest issue that snl's had over the over the last several years has been whether it's developing characters through their cast members or developing the cast members to then portray those specific characters like you always remember Will Ferrell's work or Bill Hader, guys like you know, people like that, where now it's like there's a lot of, you know, there's some talented guys. Bowen Yang's very talented. There are some talented people on the cast. It's just sometimes I think maybe they've, they're falling short by the writing team or maybe they, they found something funny and it just didn't work or it gets beaten into the dirt a little bit too much. But I think right now you're probably thinking that they're going to run politics pretty heavy until probably until the end of the season, quite honestly, because there's going to be something, you know, big going on at least through next January. So there, there's always going to be something topical for them to, to, to kind of delve into. They're always, you know, their they're SNL shorts or their short videos where they have music videos or, you know, skits within the skits almost, if you will, that are very funny pre-recorded things. Those are always pretty good. I think when you have time to kind of really mature the material, I think it, it's better for them as opposed to, okay, we've got Jean Smart. Let's start writing something for her. And maybe you can plug her into one of your SNL digital shorts or something, but sometimes that's not always going to happen. But, you know, there's a lot of hope, but you wonder, I'm, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of former cast members that are sprinkled you know, throughout the year, I would guess a Will Ferrell, a Jimmy Fallon, somebody they're going to bring in as many heavy hitters as they can. This is the 50th season. And I, I, I don't think they want it to go unnoticed. Just have to point what? out the irony of, I just have to point out the irony real quick of Craig saying that 
Jean Smart needs a good writer uh, to to write for her for uh, for this for this season fifty premiere of SNL because Hacks is basic, of course, all about uh, her finding you know her voice and another writer. Uh, so okay. and, and, and Hannah, I'm Bender. Maybe they need to call her up and get her yeah. in the writers group or something. But <laughs> yeah. well, and and I kind of wondered too. You guys are right. It's not like you don't have to have. A bunch of old stars as guests, like some of the best silent lives is where, like I, I Craig had the word for it, I sprinkle them in where a cameo. You know, yeah, like yeah. I I heard rumors that with Harris, you know, and Maya Rudolph might come back, which would be nice. You know, Maya that would Rudolph make sense, and she would yeah. be great. I'm sure she and, will. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure she will. And. Yeah, like you saw some of that too, even like when Bernie Sanders was like Larry David. Larry David, you know, yeah. You're like, please, Bernie Sanders, stay in there longer. I want more Larry David. It'd be great. Yeah. Who are they gonna get that. to do who are they gonna get to do JD Vance, do you think? Did you see that who who was it that had was it um who had uh um Haley Joel Osment as uh as JD Vance recently? Oh. Did you see that? No, he was Perfect in that, and like, but he was on another talk show. I wonder if they could do that. Haley Joel Osment does a pretty good JD Vance, I okay. thought. Or, um, or, or like, <laughs> Colin Joseph is the same body type. You think maybe that? Yeah, maybe. maybe yeah, he doesn't know. really do that. Do I that. Mean, no. They don't yeah. really use Colin Jost very much outside of Weekend Update. Okay. So I mean, that's not that's not to say that he couldn't do that. It's just, you know, I I wonder if. And you got to wonder too, like if because if you're SNL, you're picking a JD Vance that may be irrelevant come November, possibly. Yeah, right. 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 So you wonder if you like, do you take advantage as much as you can in the event that maybe they don't win, you know, the election? So then Vance is kind of not really a main player anymore, or do you um, maybe have a cast member be Vance, and then if, if for instance they win, maybe you then go out and get you know, the, the next JD Vance, like a Haley Joel Osment or somebody that can play them routinely, you know, as a guest spot, but I don't know. I mean, you know, I think, um, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Obviously things are going to get ultra political because that's the, the, the flavor of the week, but you know, at, at a certain point you want other things too on screen. So, you know, obviously you'll probably do cold opens, you know, with, yeah. with the politics and then I'm sure they'll do, they'll sprinkle in some politic, you know, type stuff every now and then, but, you know, hopefully they rely more on like, let's write for these, these guest hosts and let's try to develop characters out of our cast members that can, you know, live on for years and years and years, as opposed to, you know, being a one-off or maybe not getting over with the crowd, if you will. Well, here's the problem. If they're starting this like Saturday, it's September 30th. I mean, you got what a little over a month before the election. Where, yeah, you can go hot and heavy with that for a month, but after a month, it's uh, we're not. Uh, it's not election day. It's election season, Chris. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna it'll be, be topical for well this. after November. Yeah. It'll be topical well after right. November. So. Especially in January, where, where some group will storm the Capitol. Sure it's gonna be. Happens, but... They're gonna be able to milk this at least until, yeah, you know, State of the Union. Or February. I mean, they're going to, and, and even after that, you know, they'll be able to do their normal, what did the president do this week that was weird or something? And then they'll have a cold open for that, or they'll have like, they're always going to have something and they've always done that. And, you know, obviously this is butted up right against a huge election for them. So they're going to really milk this as, as long as they can. But, you know, it's, it's definitely going to be, It'll be. I wonder if they'll have someone in, you know, play Tim Waltz or something. You know, I mean, who knows? Um, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. How how unique they're going to get, or how you know intricate they're going to get with it, or is it just going to be like a Trump and Kamala Harris type of deal, or will they get a JD Vance? Will they get Tim Waltz? Will they get other political players out there that um, you know maybe they can you know try to roast as well as move their story along. The problem with it is, you're like, yeah, you want variety in SNL, but it's always, there's always been politics in SNL. Yeah. There have always been presidential impersonators on SNL. There always have been. 
from the beginning. And the other problem problem with it is there's just so much material. It's just it's, such a there's just it, it's just, you know reality um, right now. It's just like yeah. we're in another dimension. It's just like you know there's just so much comical material. And yeah. it, you know yeah. if it wasn't reality, it would be really funny. But you know sometimes it's right. not very because it because well, it's too real. Yeah. But well, um, I get. I guess that's my hot take because what election was it? It was like sixteen or twenty, where they literally had like a midweek, um, weekend update where they it literally was like a half hour show where it was all mm-hmm. weekend update. And I think it was around the election and everything. Yeah, hot take because I'm like, man, this year they should have had it because we missed they're eating dogs and cats and it was like oh, they missed so much. So yeah. much. You know, you know they're gonna go to that well. But see, here's one even a thinking. month after the fact, or four what? weeks, or three, or two, well, however many weeks that it's been now since that came out, you know that SNL is going to find a way to sprinkle that. It may not be the main attraction, but you know they're going to sprinkle that in, whether it's a cold that, open. That, like Chris said, that's the problem with it, though, is that like, like you know, every it's all like every every day or every other day, every week. There's something else, something new, and it's just like you know, if you take that much time off, you know, you come back and you got to catch up, and it's like, okay, you know, what are we what are we in on? You know, like, yeah. but <laughs> it's, here, it's too much. But here's part of but part of the problem with political satire is, and like my family never got to like, oh, why are they saying that stuff? Well. You take what happens and you make it ten times more ridiculous. I mean, you know, that's think of like the old Bush Gore debates in Saturday Night Live and other stuff like that. Yeah, yeah th- those were crazy, but they got to a certain spot crazy, but the SLL successfully made them a hundred times crazier. Well, with especially, and I know we're not, we're not going to get to choosing sides or whatever, but with Trump, there's no limits to the crazy. And you know they're yeah. eating cats and dogs would have been a really cool, funny comedy line if you take one thing you said went to the nth degree. But when it goes to the nth degree, where do you go from there? And I'll, I'll be really hot take. I am definitely not toward the Trump way. If you want to know my political feelings right now, again, not important, whatever. But I gotta tell you, Colbert, I'm out on Colbert. I, I agree with what he talks about. It just gets old when he talks about it every every night. I'm I'm starting to get out in Kimmel. I used to like Kimmel for his like biting political commentary, and I agree with what he says. I'm like, it just isn't as humorous. Yeah, but the I, the good thing. Sorry to cut you off, but the the good thing about Saturday Night Live though is that it might be seven minutes of it or however many minutes the cold open is and then it's done and you might get some sprinklings and weekend update but generally speaking you're not going to get like beat over the head with it like you would with Kimmel or or, or Colbert every night like this is a once a week you're probably going to get something for five to five to ten minutes total but then there's going to be so much other stuff going on around it that it'll probably drown out how much you get hit over the head with it you have we'll to pace yourself on this stuff. Like that's why John Stewart does the Daily Show once a week. Guys can't do it. Can't do no. it five days a week anymore. It's but, just but, too much. You gotta, you gotta, you know, it's, it's too this. much for anybody. You gotta pace the yourself. Show with Stewart and the other people on the show is brilliant right now because yeah, they're pointing out the ridiculousness of what Trump is saying, but they're also pointing the finger the other way when it warrants it. So I yeah. love that. Yeah, and obviously yeah. you got. I mean. Whatever you think about Trump, it's a little ridiculous. So, you know, point out the ridiculous a lot more. I I think Oliver, you know, Craig's guy, I think he does the same thing, which is good. I like Shay and Joe's. I, I didn't like them when they first came on SNL. I think they're brilliant. And I like the fact where they're way over the top. They get edgy sometimes or when they read the jokes to each other and everything else. I kind of miss hearing what Shay and Joe says. Like, you know, Colbert, Malon. I, I can listen to changes. If they do a, po- a podcast on politics, it'd be interesting. Well, they they do have a um, a, a night t- a nighttime special or whatever it's called on Peacock right now. So maybe maybe are they, are they hosting a comedy show or, or is it just for them? I I don't know if it's. I I think it might just be comedy specials, maybe every once in a while or something. But you know, maybe that's. Um, and I haven't seen it yet, so I'm not sure if it's kind of in the vein of Weekend Update or if it's like stand-up comedians doing their thing or whatever. But, you know, maybe that's the uh, the way to get more Che and Jost, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. 
Sounds good. Hey, so um, we've talked about this before, but that Saturday Night Live movie, so it's just called Saturday Night. Oh, yeah, well, exactly. It's out soon. It's coming out soon. I think it's coming out, uh, it looks like October, the weekend of October 11th. And right now it's got pretty good reviews. Uh, it's got an average 79% on Rotten Tomatoes. And I think the trailers for that look pretty good. I think it looks like a, I, I definitely want to see it. With my Absolutely. family, it's hard to get to the theater, but that's definitely a movie I want to check out. Even when it gets a streaming or whatever. So it's good. Hey, I am up against This is good. I, I love how we can go in depth on stuff. Uh, there's just a lot of good stuff out there. Um, check out the story. And I'll put the notes for when we publish this. Um, Australian, uh, there was a publication that did a lot about the Australian office. And it was interesting. It was a little in-depth. I'd like to talk about that. We don't have time to do it tonight. Um, so, yeah. So, d- definitely check that out. Um, what am I watching? I was going to mention something. I am way too into the stupid football season watching Big Brother. I don't know, man. I, I'm I'm regretting my TV choices right now. I will <laughs> tell you that. Um, I'm not watching anything trendy. So, I mean... Quickly, you guys watch anything good, or is, are you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm. You know, we we uh, we did a rewatch of Superstore, so that's kind of been the only okay. thing so that we've been doing is uh, kind of plugging away and just uh, binge watching Superstore over again. Other than that, nah, nothing really trendy. I have a big list of things I want to get into, <laughs> and I haven't had a really chance to do it yet. But um, there's definitely there's some stuff out there I need to catch up on. Um, the new season of Rings of Power on Amazon Prime, which I'm really okay. into that. So I think it's just masterfully. I mean, they spent they spent like a billion dollars on an episode on that or something. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration, but not by much. But you can certainly see it in the production values. It's just a beautiful looking show. So I want to okay. check that out. And um, you know, we're um, we're into season four now. Is it season four of Only Murders in the Building? Um, I don't know, Chris, if you tried to catch up on that yet, but just a fantastic show. Um, I want to watch, um, you know, uh, the new Marvel show on Disney Plus, the the WandaVision spinoff, Agatha All, All Along. Um, seems like a good one to watch around Halloween, sort of witch centric. Um, mm-hmm. So lots of stuff on my list, but I just it, right now we're watching Suits. Uh, okay. We're like pretty deep into like watching Suits on Netflix and. Um, I've been watching The Shield on uh, Hulu. Wow. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks, guys. As always, I appreciate it. Check out the other stuff we put out. We've got a diverse uh, bunch of stuff c- uh, coming out. Um, had some Cedar Point content uh, the other day, which is good. Um, Mike Brown, a former boss of mine when I was a sports writer to Alliance Review, um, he's coming on. He's going to um, he's fired up about the Browns, so we're doing some Browns discussion each week with him. Uh, lots of good stuff, so check us out each day. Share us with your friends. Um, give us stars. I mean, I, I, don't, I never really ask for reviews, but if you give us uh, a good review, or even any review at all, it gets in the hands of more people. So for Robert and Craig, this is Chris. Thanks for checking us out. Have a great day, everybody. See you guys.